I am a man of constant sorrow. I don't know the other words. That was ridiculously impressive. Thank you. Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. Great, you jackass. Now people are just going to be disappointed by our own theme. I'm sorry. I worked <laughs> fucking hard on that. <laughs> My name is Eric. I'm here today with young Frankenstein, I guess. <laughs> Michael okay. Kester and um, what other movie are we doing today? Yeah, what other movie are we're doing? Young Frankenstein, but mm. we're doing another movie. Yeah, we're gonna do uh, Oh Brother Where Art Thou? Surprise! Yeah, this is a uh, this is a show about movies featuring stage shows, I guess. Yeah, stage shows. Furthermore, not just stage shows, but stage shows that culminate in food being thrown and people being carried out by a mob. Yeah, monsters crowd surfing out of the. That's not actually what we are no. doing with this show. No. It, isn't it weird? You pick two movies almost at random and they come together and they have the they have the same fucking yeah, scene in it's them. pretty crazy so weird um i think actually we we're going for uh films that build upon legends sure although i did not remember that about oh brother yeah. where art thou i've seen that movie several times actually uh-huh. and I, it even spells it out for you yeah there are in points. the film even <laughs> even before the film even starts but somehow i just forgot about that uh, also, these are directors that we haven't really covered before. Right, that we both kind of need to cover, I guess. Yeah, we need to learn more about, yeah. probably. I have a desire to learn more about both of the directors. Yeah. I think you've been going down a Mel Brooks road. Yeah. So you kind of know, I'm just, I know nothing about right. that. Um, if you tune into the show thinking you're going to learn something, today uh, there are much better places to learn about both of these directors, both of these films. But you got to start somewhere, and I think this is a great starting. We've been looking to do Cohen stuff for a while, yeah. too. Yeah. Where do you fucking start? There's just so much stuff. Right. Uh, you want to tackle something culty first? Do you do something Whereas funny? we may have accidentally knocked, knocked out the best Mel Brooks. Right, yeah. <laughs> but that's okay. That won't stop us from doing more. No, no. We're not worried all. about good films. We're worried about important films here on Double Feature. Excellent. So uh, having said that, we're going to spoil both of the films. Uh, where, do you, where do you fall on spoilability here? Uh, you know, you can't really the Frankenstein and the Odyssey. Yeah, right. Every, it, they you know really it. are you know Frankenstein it. and the Odyssey. It's so crazy. The only spoiler may be that I just said they really are right. both of those films. However, if you haven't seen the films or you don't care about them or you want to hear us talk for less than an hour, right? You want to yeah. hear fifteen minutes a show, you can use the chapter section, probably just skip to the ending, which will be fifteen minutes because yeah. we have to talk about the music box massacre coming up next time. Uh, actually, you should just skip there right now. Figure out what films those are and start watching them because it's why it's twelve films or something, something ridiculous. ridiculous. So, Young Frankenstein. I'll mm-hmm. tell you what I do know. Okay, right? uh, because this is such fresh territory for me. I know Gene Wilder. Yes, uh, I know Gene Wilder is a crazy person. Yes, first of all, and uh, he's raving mad in this film as well. I mean, they open on that classroom scene. You know, uh-huh. he's going to be raving mad, right? Because it's right. Frankenstein, right? Yes. Uh, but Frankenstein. Even at that point. even the opening classroom. He just loses yeah. his shit. Yep. Uh, he just totally lashes out at a student. And what I find weird about that scene is that the students clap. They applaud him yeah. for overcoming sure. his accidental heritage. Sure. Right. Starting to sound like Richard Dawkins talking about accidents of birth. Mm-hmm. You know, he didn't ask to be born into that family. But you know that he is, uh, he's eventually going to become Frankenstein. And it's just going to get nuttier from there. Right. Both the Gene Wilder and the Gene Wilder hair are going to get yes. crazier. Right. Also, Marty Feldman yeah. is just my fucking hero. I love Marty I shouldn't Feldman. Th- I shouldn't throw that word around loosely, but Marty Feldman is, a, how about this, an extremely cool fucking dude. Yeah. So someone we saw in, I guess we should tag it yeah. right here. You ready? Yeah. The Adventure of Sherlock Holmes' Smarter Brother. There we go. And that's going to come up about one million more yeah. times. It's the only thing I have to latch on okay. to, so I'm just well, going you, to be... Willy Wonka, come on. Oh, that's true. That's true as I well. I mean, that's a weird... Everybody's seen it, and it doesn't really... It, it feels weird as a Gene Wilder thing. Yeah, but, but he's still mad there. in that yeah. one as well. That's what that movie is, is Gene Wilder being a crazy person. Uh, so what I didn't know... I've done some Marty Feldman homework. Mm-hmm. I have not done any Mel Brooks homework, but I've done some Marty Feldman homework since seeing uh, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes' younger brother. Yeah. Because smarter, that would, smarter, and younger. smarter, younger brother. Jesus, I try so hard to get it. Cr- it's such a long fucking title that wouldn't even fit in our stupid podcast <laughs> feed. I had to shorten it. I felt aw- I hate when I have to bridge the titles mm-hmm. of the movies. 
So this Marty Feldman character was extremely odd, and I had to find out more about it. Turns out uh, he's a writer. He's written yeah. a ton yes. of movies. I guess he had a TV show like in the 80s or something where he really? played I didn't, I don't different. Think, I, yeah. didn't, I didn't know that. It was probably because he died in the 80s, right? Yeah. So it was probably even before that uh, where he played these weird characters. And then he uh, directed something as well. He did, I think it was In God We Trust, okay. something to that. Yeah, In God We Trust. And I think it had a dollar sign for an S at the end. Uh, wrote and directed that as well. A man of many talents yeah. and just fucking awesome. He's hilarious. Just love the guy. He's absolutely completely hilarious. Completely embraces being typecast. Yeah. Completely gets. He's a weird looking guy. He's yeah. okay with it. He, yeah. he uses it. Yeah. And it's what makes it work. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things people love about him. But it's not just that sort of, okay, he's overcoming something or whatever. But to use that to the extent that he does to manage to get the laughs out of right. that. I mean, he's almost the one who makes fun of. I don't want to say the other character, but kind of, you know, mm-hmm. he's the person you're watching the movie along with and everyone else is playing a bit more of a straight role. They're still not playing straight right. roles. It's right. a fucking Mel Brooks, Gene Wilder movie. But uh, he is just completely over the top. But who is this Mel Brooks guy? Okay, well, so I don't understand. Mel Brooks is, I mean, Mel Brooks is Blazing this, Saddles, right? Blazing Saddles. Mel Brooks did Robin sure. Hood, Men in Tights. Space remember balls. that vaguely. Um, sure. These are the, all movies I his saw. His last one was the Dracula one. Dracula, Dead yeah. and Loving It. Leslie Nielsen, right? Who's not, not Liam Neeson, right? Not the same guy. So, Young Frankenstein is—it's not his first film. I think it's his second film. Sure, but, but he did Blazing Saddles before it, actually. Really? Uh, I think yeah. I think he had a few things okay. before that were less well known. Yeah. But I'm not the guy to talk to right. about. That. So anyway, it's one of the early films, mm-hmm. and it's co-written by Gene Wilder, which not all of them were. But Mel Brooks is widely known as a—he's a comedy guy. He's yeah, a funny guy for sure, and he cameos all the time in his films. Apparently, though, not, not in Young in Frankenstein. Young Frankenstein. Though. Yeah. I wouldn't have known what to look for anyway. Right. So uh, you would, uh, you would. <laughs> yeah. Believe me, you can tell in a Mel Brooks film who Mel Brooks is. Sure. All right. So all of Mel Brooks's jokes are the jokes where they call out the punchline. Those are Mel Brooks jokes. All right. Great. It seems like he just enjoys people rolling their eyes. Yeah. Gene Wilder likes to make people laugh. Mel Brooks likes to make people roll their eyes and, really hard. and scoff. Yeah, yeah. This film is, it's great. This is my favorite one because it's got plenty of the Gene Wilder jokes and just a little kind of tinge of the Mel Brooks sure. ridiculousness. It's the kind of comedy you need. So this was a good experiment for us because uh, you can you can definitely tell the jokes apart from the yeah. Gene Wilder. And a lot of Gene Wilder stuff is in his performance. Mm-hmm. But uh, you can tell the the written material part because he wrote this. Gene Wilder helped write this sure. as well. So we started watching this movie by ourselves, and then some people came over. The stuff that is eye rolling ends up being funnier with more people in the room. Right. I noticed myself laughing all the time at. It's almost like having a laugh track. Yeah. You know, they say something stupid on the screen, they turn and look at you, yeah. and then everyone <laughs>, laughs almost out of like a, a nervous sense, and then you laugh at yourself laughing. Right. And it turns into this prolonged line. And that's part of, you know, the mechanics of having one of those lines. When you anticipate a crowd laugh like that, you almost allow more time for it. Look at canned laughter stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's always that lengthy pause in there where they wait for the canned laughter to be over. So when you're watching it by yourself, that just makes it way worse. Because they say a line, they applaud themselves for saying the line. They turn to you to wait for your reaction and then nothing happens in the film for like 40 <laughs> sure. seconds. Right. Uh, whereas when you have a crowd, it's perfect timing. Everything works mm-hmm. brilliantly. Without getting too much into the Gene Wilder stuff yet, what I was really impressed by, and maybe I'm wrong. This feels so wrong to be impressed by. <laughs> okay. Uh, the look of the film. First yeah. is black and white. Yeah. Is it wrong that I'm so impressed no, that this think, movie is black that and white? I think that's a big... I just went, I mean, whoa, ballsy. I don't want to... I don't... It's. Re- I get what you're saying. It's hard to It's hard to go, Mel Brooks, wow, what a visionary look for your film. <laughs> yeah, right. But, I mean, that's what he does. It feels courageous. Blazing Saddles. I mean, you've seen Blazing Saddles. No, I haven't. Okay, so Blazing Saddles looks just like a Western. Really? Yeah. All right. Looks just like a Western. Young Frankenstein looks like it came out of... 19, you know, 1920s, sure, 1930, sure. around the same time that Oh Brother, Where Art Thou actually takes place. Sure, sure. So all the stuff is really glossy. It all the all the scenes with the lighting look like Cary Grant hugging, you know, <laughs> right. Lauren Bacall <laughs> right. and weird stuff like that. So it suddenly feels like we're doing Grindhouse. You yeah. know what I mean? It's it's throwbacks to um, you know, what we always call for, taking the old genres and building upon them. 
But I mean, it's not just the black and white. It's the music, too. Mm -hmm. Especially in the beginning. That fucking three note, isn't that scary? Look what (laughs) I just did. Monster music. Unfortunately, my voice makes two notes, which is why you do the singing on this show. But uh, (laughs) what does that sound? Bum, bum, bum. I think it goes up and then down. Ahem. Bum, bum, bum. Oh, yeah, that's what it is. That kind of worked. Yeah, that was all right. (laughs) You got an impression of what I was talking about. I will never do that again. And then the extended credits. You know, that's that's why I use Grindhouse rather than something that's being more cheeky. It's comedy, but to go through the, the through the pains of it, it is pains. Yeah. When you put the credits at the beginning of the film, turns out that's not a good idea and it's why we stopped doing it. Uh-huh. But I guess you could probably make arguments for that if you really we will strain and do that when we do some more Roger Corman weird monster uh-huh. shit. You have a couple minutes of you're just sitting there. Credits at the beginning, like an old 30s, sure. you know, like the fucking Frankenstein, like 19, yeah. <laughs> it's 1931 again. We're watching Frankenstein. And in the background, and I know you haven't seen a lot of these, but it is crazy how accurate it is. It's the fucking Roger Corman castle. Yeah. Now, I wish I had written down somewhere what movies this appears in, but Roger Corman, I know I've talked about it before, so I won't go into it, but Roger Corman did all these movies together. He did, I, I want to say it was four of them that he did back to back or in um instances of two at separate times but he used the same sets he used vincent price and they all take place in this they're not supposed to but they do because that's what he had available they all take place in this creepy fucking house uh it's the house of usher and i don't even know if the roger corman castle appears in the house of usher okay but i just imagine that that's the house all right and it's right around when he did all of that stuff and it's the same it's up on a fucking hill and it's reused over and over and over in those movies. It's Scary Monster House. Uh-huh. And that is it. That's what it is. But you noticed it in the sets, too. Sure. Right? I mean, yeah. 1930s oh, sets. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, they do, I mean, they go back and they do a lot of, you know, brickwork and a lot of set stuff. Right. And all the breakaway door stuff. Sure. All <laughs> yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, when he, when he busts up, Frankenstein's monster busts out of the door of the blind man. Also, lots of blind men yeah. in these films Gene today. Hackman as the blind man. Yes, yes. Um, and, uh... And he busts out of that door, and the pieces come breaking apart yeah. just as they were taped together. Uh, yeah, it's wonderful. Sure, and you get a lot of, I mean, you get a lot of the old, you know, the old horror comedy gags yeah. with the the spinning bookcase is yeah. always one of my favorite parts sure. of this film. I think... I expected the painting to have eyes behind right, it. That's exactly, the territory like that. we're in, yeah. But the spinning bookcase, I always remember that scene. That is, the first time I saw the film, I was watching it with my sister, who you know, and my sister sure. doesn't ever laugh at anything your sister is um, the ultimate straight man yeah actually exactly so we were watching this movie and i was feeling bad for laughing because right. i'm thinking you know oh these are funny jokes and she's sure. doing the thing that you know you would do watching it alone where you go i don't understand why this is right. supposed to be funny <laughs> right and they get to this bookcase scene and he says i don't know if you remember it but they're trying to figure out how to get him back by placing and removing yeah, for the sure candle at for the right sure time. so he says the thing where he's like okay now remove the candle, and I will stop the bookcase <laughs> with my body. Right. Great idea, by the way. And my sister cracks up at that moment. Before he gets stuck? Yeah. So when he says yeah. that. Okay, right. <laughs> and so that was the point where I knew that, that we were dealing with this weird hybrid of, you know, 70s vaudevillian revival comedy. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of what Mel Brooks and Gene sure, Wilder are sure. based in is the vaudevillian. The That's where the right? fucking stage the show comes from, too. Sure, exactly. Yeah. And then... He uh he gets caught in the fucking thing, right? Which <laughs> yeah. is just the most slapstick bullshit. Yeah, right. And it's hilarious. The wall walked into him. I yeah, mean, how exactly. much more? It's fucking Rob Schneider at that point. Yeah. And that is such a testament to his performance sure. that today Rob Schneider does these gags and we make fun of him uh-huh. for it. But Gene Wilder carries so much weight that he can run into a wall uh-huh. and it is legitimate. It feels like he's totally earned that laugh. Yeah. Um, another thing is the transitions between these scenes. Yeah. So I know I'm like Mr. You know, fucks around and iMovie guy or whatever, but you notice this too, right? All of the wipes, the wipes. and the diamond the cir- stuff. And the, and the, cir- the, yeah. the circle closing in on people's <laughs> right. faces is one of my favorites. Right. Uh, transitions like that always seem obnoxiously obvious to me. And I didn't know as someone who doesn't play around with that kind of stuff, if that was something you really notice or if it was like a, a more subtle thing. No, I mean, I, I you, you look at it, but instead of it looking annoying, you go, oh, those people in the 30s. Right, yeah. And it takes you out of it in yeah. a good way. It makes you have to go, no, no, this 
this is 40 years after sure. that was okay. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so for the people who actually do watch every single movie we put on the show, mm-hmm. first, I applaud you. Uh, if you've watched everything we've ever done, send us an email because I'm really curious about that. Uh, double feature show at gmail.com. But the people who've been playing along in recent years have uh, probably seen the, let's see if I can do it this time, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes' Smarter Brother. Yeah. There we go. Pretty close. All right. Fuck you. I even got the article in the beginning. The Adventures. It's adventure, though. It's oh, a singular God adventure. Damn it. They invent these movie titles to mock me. So this isn't that far off from i mean this is a movie that has nothing to do with mel brooks uh adventure i mean yeah i'm just gonna start calling it adventure is that okay single adventure one adventure that he's having i believe i had to make that distinction on that goddamn show too fuck i learned nothing in in my (laughs) years of doing this nothing at all but that was a movie that if i remember correctly was written written and directed right by gene wilder Wilder. okay so that's starring marty feldman and madeline khan who are obviously both in this film too so excellent case study to then compare that to this but we're dealing with pretty similar territory, right? Yeah. So the comedy that Gene Wilder is familiar with, Sherlock Holmes' Smarter Brother came out after Young Frankenstein. Right, right. But comedy in the 70s, in this troupe, it's really, it's a troupe. Mm-hmm. Marty Feldman, Madeline Kahn, Mel Brooks, and all these actors were really vaudevillianly trained. Sure. I, I don't even think that's a, an adjective, but that's what we're using. Okay. I mean, look at the producers. The first Mel Brooks movie, it's about... What's that, Mel Brooks? Yeah. All right. The first Mel Brooks movie and Gene Wilder, too, it's about, you know, obviously it's about these producers right. who... I love the producers. I never knew that was Mel Brooks. Yeah. I actually don't know if I've seen the original, though. I think I've seen it um, as a play and then yeah. as the movie based With... on the play that the movie was based right, on. Right, exactly. So, yeah, it's about, I mean, it's about a stage show. The first Mel Brooks movie is about a stage show. All of these actors are classically trained in academies. So I don't, it may sound like I know far more than I could <laughs> possibly know. You're doing know, a good job here. But I actually did read Gene Wilder's biography. Wow, so I'm excellent. On this. All of these actors are trained in, in acting academies in theaters. I mean, they are trained for the theater, sure. in the theater. They can, That's why they can all fucking sing, right? Yeah. Every single why actor in this movie can into- sing. Wow, and comedy's based around music numbers. Exactly. Once again, a theme of the show today. Uh, yeah, uh, getting that Vincent Price vibe. Once yeah. again, theatrically trained actor. You know, don't make them like they used to actor in this fucking monster movie. So something that uh, is true of both of these movies is this isn't, uh, at least on the surface, once you get into it, it totally is, but this isn't the story of Frankenstein. Right. This is the story of the son, right? The yeah. gr- young, grandson. Young Frankenstein, the grandson. Yeah, right. And uh, when we saw Sherlock Holmes, I mean, it wasn't Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. It was the adventure of Sherlock Holmes' smarter boyfriend? No. Oh, brother. Was... Fuck. So we're dealing with relatives. Why do you think they play around in that arena rather well, than just saying, up oh, remake? Basically, what you get to do is you get to reinvent the character in a way where i mean it's funny right your younger brother is funny yeah (laughs) yeah yeah immediately (laughs) so you get to you can make that character as much like the original literary you know victor von frankenstein right but also as different as you need to for all the jokes also you get to introduce the whole environment to them for the first time in a different way if you're remaking the thing you have to sure at least go this character is this guy if you're making a new character who's a descendant you can decide how much of that character has gone right. through the lineage so no one's going to call you out as being an adaptation or a remake right exactly. no one's going to say that's not how it happened that's in the exactly fucking they book, don't say right? that's not how it goes yeah. in the book so you can do whatever you want and it also allows you now we didn't see this so much with uh, the adventure mm-hmm. of Sherlock Holmes, Smarter Brother. Uh, because, you know, it, Sherlock Holmes is a series. People know Sherlock Holmes in that world. So sure. well, it also didn't... Sherlock Holmes is in it. Yeah, right, right. Uh, but when we deal with young Frankenstein, this is a town that has been wronged right, before. Exactly. Now, you can't just do the Chronicles of Frankenstein because, come on, you might as well just do the young fucking Frankenstein. And so the town has been wronged before. They've seen the monster before. And we don't have to go through the usual Mm -hmm. bullshit. We can just jump right into what's funny about Frankenstein. Well, also, the other thing that it gets around is this is a 70s comedy, right? Uh And it's got to be lighter. You can't kill a little girl in a 70s comedy. So that's how they get around that, right? There's the scene where Peter Boyle gives the great, I'm going to throw the girl in the well look. Right, yeah, yeah. And instead, he ends up 
catapulting her on a seesaw into her right, bed, safe right. and sound. But the townspeople are still enraged. Yeah, they're you know, very he mad. Does not kill this girl, but they're still enraged because they remember the exactly. Death of they don't the have girl. to worry about right. having anybody do anything wrong. Yeah, because. The book has done that for them. Yep. The wrongs have been done, and the town can react to a completely innocent scenario, an innocent version of what was, you know, supposedly the first horror tale ever told. Yeah. So I have seen the first horror tale ever told, as I roll my eyes at that, too. Um, On the big screen, as they say, the way it's meant to be seen, as I'm sure you'll hear on the Music Box show next time. I don't remember the name of the, th- which is terrible because they did something cool. And right. so I should remember sure. it, but it was so long ago. And by so long ago, I, I mean a year and a half ago. So yeah. whatever. But, um, there was Dracula, there was the mummy and there was Frankenstein. So I saw the 31 Boris so, Karloff. What, two Karloffs and a Lugosi is what <laughs> yeah. you watch. Yes. That's how you want it. You want two Karloffs and a Lugosi. Yeah. That's a good ratio. So having seen that beforehand, I actually got the feeling as you and I were watching young Frankenstein wait, haven't I seen this before? And I actually had to look up a couple things to make sure that they were, in fact, in the original Frankenstein. The thing that gets me, and I'm so glad that they did this in Young Frankenstein, although, had I just watched it, I would have appreciated it so much more. Um, Have you seen anything from the original Boris Karloff? Oh, yeah, Frankenstein. Okay, so there is a scene in that movie, and it's such an out-of-place scene, uh, the abnormal brain scene, where he goes in to get a brain, he gets a normal brain, jar fucking labeled normal brain, right? Because that's what you sure. write on your brain in a jar. And he drops it because there's a sudden sound or something and then picks up the jar labeled abnormal brain because that's the only other one around. And I remember watching it in a theater and everyone else sitting around me, it's fucking film students or something that must have come out. And they're just staring at it and they're going, oh, abnormal brain. Very interesting. Write that down. And it's a slapstick moment. Right. And I don't understand well, how anyone yeah. was dealing with this and they, seriously. They basically redo the same thing. It's the thing, same fucking scene. Except, yeah. except Mel Brooks writes, do not use this yeah, brain. Right, right. Abnormal. And I am so glad that they called them out on that scene. Yeah. Here you're doing a movie that's, uh, you could call it a parody of Frankenstein, mm-hmm. right? I, th- I oh, think yeah, we're sure. in. We're Absolutely. In, um, I think we're in that territory, but this is one of the only things that it's just directly pulled mm-hmm. off with oh, uh, yeah. with basically no addition sure. except <laughs> please right. don't use the Abbey Normal brain. And then they make the Abbey Normal. Uh, well, and joke then the other scene on. that's directly taken from the Karloff version is the the tap dancing scene where they do putting on the Ritz. No, actually, I don't remember that being. Oh, okay. in the, I'm pretty sure that's not in the Karloff version. Okay, so I talked about your sister as the straight man, which I'm sure will offend her in all sorts of ways. Thank God, no one we know listens to this fucking show except Mr. Zombie. This is a movie, and I don't know if I've ever seen this. The film is the straight man. The movie is playing it straight, and all of the other characters, to various degrees, kind of get that they're making yeah. jokes. Uh, the older woman doesn't quite get it. Or and the, Leachman. Yeah, the lab assistant is a little ditzy. Right. But I think even them, they still, there's a little bit of winking at the camera. Sure. You know what I mean? Well, you there's not, that, a, right? not a little. They look at the camera <laughs> well, and fucking wink well, at Well, I don't know about scenes. those characters in particular, do they? Oh, no, I mean, not those I, Some of the characters, okay, yes. Okay, yeah. You're directly. Right. Frankenstein's monster yeah. looks directly into the camera well, several times. But Cloris Leachman gets the great punchline. That's right. He was my boyfriend. Oh, yeah, right. Right. How do you play that straight? It just can't be done. So you have a bunch of characters who are in, they're in a box, right? They're mm-hmm. in the straight man box sure. and they're just goofing around inside there and the film, and this is such a beautiful idea and I don't know why this isn't done more because the film, you don't have to worry about the performance of the film. The film's not going to accidentally snicker at your joke, right? Right. The audience will, the actors will, uh, you need someone really great to pull off a straight man performance Throughout the 70s, you saw people who were so good at that. Yeah. Uh, Steve Martin is somebody yeah. who does that a lot. Um, there's a there's a role I have yet to show you, but it's Michael Caine playing across Steve Martin as a straight man, which is really interesting. Actors who were known for being able to pull off that performance. Here, you don't need to worry about that. Everyone can make jokes, have a fun time, and the film will still do that stupid fucking music cue right. and the black and white and the shadows and the tone that tells you, come on, guys, this is a really serious story. They are the Linda Hamilton of the right. uh, young Frankenstein film. I think probably the most over-the-top one was, so there's Igor. Mm-hmm. And in the beginning, he says, uh, he calls it a hunch. Yeah. And then he actually says, badum chi, yeah. after his joke. Yeah. Completely, just in that performance yeah. that only he can give. It's 
perfect. And the film says, ah, a hunch, a clue. This is, <laughs> right. this is an important... Right. You know, the film still doesn't fucking get it. And he, he says, Badum Chi, film that is speaking Greek to the film, does not understand what Tom's you're like, saying. What is, is that code? <laughs> yeah, right, that's right. There's more clues, there's riddles buried in what he's saying. So the other thing I love, it's actually after the floor show, <laughs> because the floor show, you just can't get enough of that. Not sure if it's better than... Is it Bunny Hop? I don't remember what it's the... It's the Kangaroo Hop. Kangaroo Hop is what it is. Also a problem I think I had when we did that yep. actual show as well. I just liked my interpretation of that movie where there are several adventures and they're doing a bunny hop <laughs> and I have denied all fact since then. But after the floor show, they have that moment where, and okay, so I bitch about Frankenstein all the time. So we don't need to do that here. Everyone knows blah, blah, Eric likes science. Frankenstein is kind of a stupid story. Unless it's the dollhouse version of Frankenstein. It's the we made technology, it got out of our control, because that story is wicked fucking cool. But there is a moment here where Frankenstein's monster gives an impassioned speech, and right. then, then, then is embraced, and then at the end of the film, everybody fucks. Yeah. How the Karloff version of Frankenstein probably should have ended. All right, so Oh Brother, Where Art Thou is okay. also a film. Yeah, we did that. One that we are covering on the show mm-hmm. right now as I speak. So Oh Brother, Where Art Thou is a Cohen film, and you're far more versed in Cohen than I am, so I'll it's hand true. that to you. But one thing that apparently I didn't come to the show expecting to be far more versed in this than you, but apparently I'm far more versed in the Odyssey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's going to be a problem. We'll get to the Odyssey stuff. Okay, that that'll be buried deep in what's going on in this <laughs> film because again, I'm going to deny the actual narrative of the film. Sure. And how it's presented and pretend that the Odyssey is really, really subtle. So I don't feel stupid for never remembering that. Okay. So hit me with some Coen Brothers shit other than Fargo. The Coen Brothers have a vast array of films in all sorts of different genres. Some I like more than others. Uh, There's some Nicolas Cage going on in here. You've seen that one, right? What, Wild at Heart? No, it's not Wild at Heart. I'll let you look up and find that one on your own. Um, Big Lebowski is another one I like. But they started doing things like Blood Simple which is kind of how I found the Coen brothers. It's sort of a uh, noir crime drama sort of thing. A very serious tone uh, all the way up into more recent films. Uh, you Burn know, After Reading. Burn After Reading was another funny one, but I was actually thinking about No Country for Old Men. Oh, right. Oh, um, my God. I totally is, forgot about yeah, that yeah. one. Well, that was one that, you know, Oscar bait or whatever. So I was pushed away from the Coen brothers. That's kind of when I first stumbled into that. Uh, I kind of went, oh, Coen Brothers, they're uh, people, they make films, I should look into this. Mm -hmm. But then that fucking movie came out and won all the awards, and here on Double Feature, we know if movies win awards, they will probably make us take a nap. Yep, not our thing. But something that, you know, much like when we mocked Fargo, I have a better understanding of now. We really need to go back and look at Fargo, because I don't know- I'm still going to mock the shit out of it. No, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. But I feel like to just discount it offhand when I haven't seen it in 10 years, something we did in year one- Maybe not acceptable in year three of the show. So there's a lot of cool stuff they're working with here. You can say many different things about the Coen brothers, uh, but of all the films they've done, and I want to say it's 20, 25 films that they, you know, wrote, directed, whatever, as a team, um, produced, all of them are pretty different. They fall into maybe five or 10 categories, but that's a lot of categories for 20 films. You know what I mean? I don't know if you could find four Coen brothers films that are that much alike. This is a movie, man, every time I try and watch Cool Hand Luke again, I end up just watching uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Because I realize I could have a stage show. Uh It's all about the stage show. I want to geek out on you really quick. There is a thing called color. And it is a, uh, (laughs) yeah, it's not the same color you may think I'm referring to, (laughs) although it does have something to do with that. It's part of the Final Cut uh, suite of programs. And so this is also a little filmmaking tip here. I'm going to give free filmmaking knowledge out on the show. Everything I know about filmmaking, as I've said before, comes from Robert Rodriguez. But the few things I know that don't come from the things I accidentally learned that don't come from Rodriguez are things I learned at the Apple store for free. They have these classes there. They're presentations that they Uh just sort of give in the background. You know, here's how you use iTunes or whatever. Here's how you download double feature on iTunes. But they will also do the professional suites of programs like final cut and while that may seem like techie knowledge that people like us probably don't need until i eventually make legitimate films Uh you learn a lot about the craft of filmmaking even just watching you know as you go there and they're like an hour long and someone makes a short film in front of you they take stock footage and they compile it and you get to see the editing process and if you can catch them there is a uh there is a class on color which is a whole utility just for manipulating color in your if you thought 
you know, I understand all of the jobs of a film. You got somebody who lights and people who act. It's pretty easy. And you don't understand why there are 300 people's mm-hmm. names in the credits. Something like color. I mean, you do it in editing a lot, but you can also have specialists who just do color. And when I was there, actually, there was a whole thing about the color in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? About how uh, the Coen brothers used this app, which is called Color, to do the color in the film. And it does some really amazing stuff. I mean, that scene where Everett's explaining that there's no treasure, um, any anytime you have the orange stuff in the foreground and the white stuff in the background, it's just all really, really cool use of color. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, I'll stop rambling about it, but check that out. They So they have them for free at the Apple Store, and I think there's a thing where you can pay 100 bucks, and someone who works there will be forced to teach you things <laughs> anytime you come in the store and give you as much time as you want. I want to say it's called one-to-one training. And you just show up and you go, hey, Cohen Brothers, they use some weird color thing. Talk to me about that for an hour. But it's, so another thing that the Cohen Brothers are really well known for is the violence in their films. Uh, in a similar way to somebody as Tarantino might mm-hmm. be known for violence in his films. Uh, something that a lot of people go to those films to see, although there's a lot more going on there. You still get violence in a movie like this that's funny. Yeah. You know, you still get... They replace the violence, the type of gang violence or crime violence they're known for, with violence to animals. Yeah, they pepper the cow with a fucking Tommy gun. They do. They do. They hit the cow with a car. They squish the frog. Yeah. Squish the frog and then whip it at a tree (laughs) because it wasn't bad enough that you smashed the frog. For a lot of people, I know you and I don't give a shit, but for a lot of people, seeing animals tortured on the screen and then thrown at trees or whatever makes them hungry is no it doesn't oh. make them want a frog burger damn it but instead makes them squeamish they really feel for the poor little animal because after all the animals aren't the seedy prison inmates from the film they're just oh poor defenseless frog it didn't even do anything right. it just happened to be around when they were well, you know no, fucking that frog the sirens. was that was uh that was pete turns out it wasn't pete oh so i guess we have to start getting it in the odyssey um, I'm going to bring you into the Odyssey by talking about psychics. Great. Is that okay? Perfect. So I get, I still get shit all the time. It, no one had a problem when we ripped on Leprechaun for psychics, okay. but when that other movie with the guy who made Spider-Man did it, that was a joke, people. Stop. I know people are writing out, they're banging out emails already. They're, hey, that guy did Evil Dead. He's a legitimate filmmaker. Uh, we really liked that movie and I still get angry emails saying, hey, the psychic was okay in that and here's why. And then they don't actually, there's just a blank where a paragraph should be, it's just it's a empty picture, space. It's a photo of the psychic. <laughs> right. And then they sign their names at the bottom. So I know who to be mad at. But this starts with a psychic, and instead of being... I mean, it's a springboard for sure. the rest of the film. Right. It's a premonition. It's uh, like something we saw in 300. Yeah. Foreshadowing of, of what's going to go on. And it's so much different than, oh shit, how do we advance the plot? Uh, first of all, and this is just buying into the fiction of a film, you're not charging like a fraud in a strip mall. I will buy that in a fictional universe, a guy wheels up to you and happens to know the future or something. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And then Everett makes fun of him directly after. Sure. But you're telling me that there's this thing called the Odyssey. Yeah. And it has something to do right. with that. So almost actually it's the entire story of Oh Brother Art Thou. In the Odyssey, there's all these seers and I mean, okay, so it's mythology, right? It's, yeah, sure. It's a Greek thing and it's all these mythological things happening. It's about Odysseus and he gets marooned and he's trying to get back to his wife and that's right. so that's the basic story of oh brother art though yeah the movie is all about ulysses Everett, Everett, sure uh going to find his wife who's being suited by some <laughs> really dorky but king of fisticuffs yeah and a- along the way they run into all of the staples of the odyssey they run into sirens which is probably the most obvious that's the one i remember from the odyssey i have actually read the odyssey sure. believe that or not um, yeah, I remember a couple of these things as we start to go through the movie, because I haven't seen Oh Brother, Where Art Thou in probably a year. Sure. And, you know, so I forget all that stuff. I don't remember them stealing pies in the Odyssey. They don't steal pies. They kind Draft. of, they steal food. I mean, they, they steal food. It is actually pretty, <laughs> pretty yeah. accurate. And, well, and then there's also the thing where in the, in the Odyssey, crewmen, I believe, get transformed into pigs. Yeah, and this right. sits into a frog. And we have the betrayal in the beginning. My favorite, I think my favorite aspect of the translation from the Odyssey of the fucking, what, way, way, way beyond anything. They couldn't write it down, right? Yeah. It, was, it was passed down verbally. Sure. 
to putting it in the 1930s is how do you do a Cyclops? Yeah, right. Well, the answer is you get the biggest actor in Hollywood, and I don't mean biggest like Jude Law was in 2004. I mean biggest like John Goodman is now or was a week or two ago. I've recently seen pictures, and the man has slimmed down quite a bit. But you get John Goodman to put an eye patch on, <laughs> yeah, right. and suddenly you have a bully Cyclops. You know what is so crazy good about this movie? is that it's in a realistic setting. Sure. It doesn't need to be in a realistic setting at all. They keep doing these things that are supernatural. The psychic in the beginning, the thing with the frog, and then later they explain them with science. Yeah. Totally uncalled for. No, not even me stood up and said, excuse me, people don't turn into frogs. Right. Because I go, okay, yeah, you're wrapping this in legend. I totally sure. get what you're saying here. That makes all of this acceptable. Yet when it happens, even the ending, yeah. hey, there's there's some science to support that. And you always get that from Everett's character. Most often you get it from Everett's character. I guess the frog thing kind of reveals itself. Uh -huh. So Everett's a guy, I mean, he's fast talking, he mocks the supernatural. He's got a really big vocabulary. But every time I see this movie, I'm surprised that he uses it correctly. I get the the feeling, and maybe he doesn't. Maybe you notice something in here. But uh, as he starts talking really fast and using big words, I start thinking con man, maybe the Cone brothers are mm -hmm. mocking a character like this saying, here's, I expect the kind of character who learned a couple big words and inserts them in wrong places. Sure. But I actually feel like he's probably a yeah, pretty smart guy, I never guy, noticed right? anything that he did wrong. Well, right. I mean, when you find out what he did, what his crime, originally he lies and says that he, what, knocked over an armored car. Sure. But- in reality, he practices law without a license. Right. I mean, you can't be a right. dumb guy. If you're going to practice law without a license... So you have to be a good con man. Exactly. Criminal or not, practicing right. law is not an easy thing. <laughs> Although easier than learning law. Practicing the law, it's very true. Is, uh, it saves you several years, I believe, of your time. So this is a guy who I keep saying to myself, maybe he's not as smart as he comes off. That's always the uh, the thesis I go into this movie with. And then look in such a backwards way, look for evidence to support that rather than just letting the evidence come to me and kind of go, what kind of guy is this? But I never really find it. It always seems like he does have a plan, although sometimes his plan is to just basically say, oh, shit, over and over as uh -huh. the barn burns down. But in the end, as they go through each of these uh, odd circumstances, you know, like recording the song where they can j it just so happens they come upon this uh -huh. and they can benefit from this scenario. He's always right there to capitalize on it. I guess I'm just so used to seeing that archetype of sloppy con man, which right. doesn't make sense, right? right? Con men should probably be good at what they're doing, but that's just a character that exists. Well, yeah, but the other thing is you have to keep in mind that this guy's based on Odysseus. Yeah. Odysseus is, he goes through the Odyssey, right? Yeah, he right. makes it. Yeah. That's why this is, this is the one in a million guy during the depression that managed sure. to pull all this shit off, put on a funny beard and get his wife to fall back in love with him, which, right. you know, that's... So in the Odyssey, Odysseus has to shoot an arrow through, I believe, 12 or 14 axe heads. Right. In Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? He has to recant some catchy tune he wrote to prove that he's a, a good guy, and the mayor pardons him and gives him a job, and he becomes an upstanding member of society. Remembering back now, I love that part of the Odyssey, because as all of these suitors are knocking at her door, and I mean... I guess you could just ruin this and attribute it to when suitors knock at your door, you have to respond because you're a woman and that's what they did in ancient blah, blah, blah. But I always think, you know, she could shut her door. Yeah. Instead, she makes them do circus tricks. Sure. <laughs> For her own Hard amusement, stuff. you have to impossible, nearly impossible tasks that only her husband could accomplish makes them go out and do these things. So Everett's a character that is larger than life. But then, as you mentioned, John Goodman shows up and crushes every scene right. he's in. I mean. You know, the, there's more Bible sales mockery there, which is pretty fantastic. But that first conversation when they're sitting in the restaurant, you know, and Everett whips off some smart, snappy thing sure. and John Goodman just smashes the entire <laughs> right. scene. And I mean, the guy is just the Coen brothers and John Goodman. It's just such a winning formula. I've never seen an occasion where I didn't love him in one of their movies. And I don't know that I've seen him in a lot of stuff right. outside of their films. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I've seen him in stuff, but never thought, wow, John Goodman is just blasting it out of the park here. I'm going to keep beating around a baseball metaphor, if you don't mind. But man, he shows up in these movies. He has two or three scenes and he just steals the show with the exception of something like The Big Lebowski, which is kind of about it. It's not about his character, but I always think, oh, The Big Lebowski, that's about John Goodman's right. character. So some violence, some John Goodman. 
a Coen Brothers thing that I think is pretty specific to this film and uh, where a lot of the notoriety from the film came from is the soundtrack. Yeah. Uh, you make note of this, I mean, really early on when you have the baptism. Sure. And it's all of these people walking out and they're using a studio recording rather than a recording uh-huh. on location. And it gives you this surreal sense of ambience because things don't line up. Mm-hmm. You should hear the reflection of the sound as you would out in the woods and the trees for people who don't care or give a shit about audio. It's basically why we sound different every time we get new equipment or move sure. in. I guess more appropriately mm-hmm. move to a new studio. It always has a certain different kind of echo to it, a certain kind of ambience to it. And you have the ambience of a studio recording, mm-hmm. of a studio recorded choir when you're outside and that's not right. what it should sound like at all. So if you can't put your finger on why that scene is so surreal, that's probably what yeah, it is. Yeah, for sure. Well, in the rest of the soundtrack, specifically the the main song, The Man of Constant Sorrow, right. I believe that's the name of the song. Well, T-Bone Burnett is credited for music sure. in the film. And T-Bone Burnett was Crazy Heart. I mean, T-Bone mm-hmm. Burnett did Crazy Heart. That sure. was his thing, which is the film that came out a while ago and got statues thrown at it or something. <laughs> right. But T-Bone Burnett, I think, is a gr- it's amazing to watch him do. He only does country stuff. Yeah. But he understands film music, the kind of music that needs to make the, make the fucking film. Yeah. So this, this soundtrack got a Grammy. Crazy Heart soundtrack got a Grammy. Sure. Again, statues just throwing at yeah. whatever. I don't understand statues. <laughs> what he's good at is taking a song, and even if it's not the best fucking song in the world, in the movie, in the world that the film is in, right. you believe that that song is the greatest song sure. ever written. Well, great example. They have the song that the Soggy Bottom Boys sing. And in the world of the film, it is on the radio all the time. Everybody fucking loves this thing. It, so it's Dan Tominsky doing uh, the impossible singing voice of this. And I also love that about, quote, old-timey, uh, I guess, bluegrass music, is that I can never imagine anyone singing this. Yeah. The voices are inhuman. I just don't know. Trying to line up a face with these voices, crazy to me. But then again, as I've said over and over on the show, all I know is Nine Inch Nails music. Right. So beyond that, and I can't, I want to come on here and tell you all sorts of wonderful things about the plethora of important musicians who worked on the soundtrack but i just don't know bluegrass i don't know country a bright falls is as close as i come to anything like that so i just don't get it but if you're interested in that there's actually a documentary about the soundtrack of the film uh it's called down from the mountain and the the whole thing i think it's a half hour long or something and it's about the music of oh brother where art thou apparently they actually toured the soundtrack. It was such a big deal. Wow. So they had these concerts where all of the people who contributed to the soundtrack were there, they showed up, they played the music. But when they released that song as a single, it did not perform well on the radio at all, completely in contradiction to how it performed in the movie. So you're right about, you know, making it believe, even if that's not the scenario in real life, that's certainly the scenario in the movie. In the fucking 30s, everyone would have loved this shit. Mm-hmm. Apparently, there's a lot of homages to different... Uh, even the name of the band is an homage to uh, some bluegrass band that I just don't know. But one of the things I've loved about the legend of that kind of country music, of that kind of blues in particular, is the story about you know selling your soul to learn to play guitar. Sure. Which is actually an homage... Did I say homage earlier? Oh, the French is slipping into the show already. <laughs> Excuse me, homage to um, an actual performer. But what I've always loved is in the end, this is the atheist to me coming out, I guess. Uh. Selling your soul, if your soul actually existed, to the devil in order to learn to play guitar, that's kind of a shitty deal, right? I don't know. I don't care how good you are at guitar. I don't know how important your everlasting your soul, is. soul Where do you go when you have no soul? Is that like a purgatory thing? I don't know how the soul works. The soul doesn't work. And the fact that people actually know the soul doesn't work is why a story like sold your soul to the devil, why that even exists. No one stops and goes, wow, that's that's a really rotten deal he got right there just to learn to play guitar. He could have, you know, learned to read, I guess, in this circumstance and then picked up a book. But because everyone really knows that the soul doesn't fucking exist, totally not a problem. So another thing that this film really does when it's paralleling itself to the Odyssey at nauseum. Odyssey, but, hit me. But absolutely blindly to most viewers, no worries, don't feel bad. Oh. Is that the Odyssey is a, it's a long trip. It's, mm-hmm. it's an Odyssey. That's it's a fucking the epic, fucking right? Title. Yeah, sure. So what goes on is this one character, he gets bounced around from place yeah. to place, from character to character, from 
Cersei to Calypso to another blind motherfucker to a Cyclops, <laughs> and then he shoots an arrow through a bunch of axes. I mean, this guy is just bouncing across the goddamn sea. Right. But nothing really takes place in between. It's always, and then he went here, sure, and sure. this happened. Yeah, you know what? I remember that, too. He just kind of winds up. He gets back on his boat and right, sails exactly. to another spot. So the movie follows suit in taking place in these short little episodes, which due to the soundtrack are almost like music videos, right? right? I mean, certain ones, they're based around musical numbers, especially that one towards the end. So part of the way through making this film, they wanted to tell this story that it would probably have been something more like Cool Hand Luke. And they realized, you know, this is kind of like the Odyssey. And rather than run from that and go, oh, no, people will call us out for Odyssey parallels. They just fully embraced it. And that's where you get it all the time. And the way I think that works really well is that you have these extremely short episodes, kind of like in Serenity, something you mentioned about uh, when we talked about Serenity, these are just mercenaries. They're going from place to place. We have three or four different stories in the film eventually leads us to where we want to go. And for being something based on a TV show, it's like getting three or four good episodes, great Mm -hmm. episodes with Serenity of Firefly. So that was excellent. And then here are the episodes. I mean, so it's perfect for a short attention span, whatever. That's wonderful. But the episodes themselves, five or 10 minutes long. I mean, they're really, really to the point where some of them are just a musical number. Walk Mm -hmm. in, look at the one where they record. They walk in, they kind of set up, especially by today's standards, you know, this would be even shorter than music videos. You walk in, you have a setup. Oh yeah, we record music. Isn't that awesome? They record the song. You don't even hear the full song and then they take off. That's it. End of episode. You get a little epilogue kind of thing right. where the the we politicians want more money than we who, deserve yeah uh, but also the politicians wandering around uh, where you you kind of wonder how well, what do these politicians uh-huh. have to oh just you wait politicians will show right up and save the day in the end that's kind of weird politicians saving the day in the end so i really like that i really like you spend a couple minutes in a place and then you just hey we're we're traveling down the road we're running from the law we show up in another place we steal a pie we fucking kill a cyclops <laughs> we um you know, they're at that clan rally, right? right? And you there's almost a moment where you think, how the fuck did they get to a clan rally? Yeah. <laughs> it just happens to be over a hill. So the clan rally and the Cyclops, really quick, this is I think one of my favorite things it does to kind of both embrace and then I guess one up the Odyssey. Yeah. If you can one up the Odyssey. Sure, I don't know if the right. Odyssey is there to one up. I'm pretty sure the Odyssey is a stepping stone and it's been built on so many times right. that it doesn't matter. But what I love... Although no one from back when the Odyssey was written is around to send us angry emails. So, fuck you, Odyssey. So, in the Odyssey, essentially, Odysseus chucks a spear or shoots an arrow into his eye. And right. Shield was heavy. Cy- it's a Got cyclops, it. right? Yeah. Okay, so you blind the Cyclops. Did you? I was wondering if you were just going to be completely unaffected by my bad 300 reference. You blind the Cyclops, the Cyclops is incapacitated. So... In O oh Brother, Where Art Thou, he chucks the spear and you go, here's the scene where they blind I don't the say Cyclops. That, but you say that. I say, here's the scene where they blind sure, the Cyclops. normal people do. And John Goodman catches the spear <laughs> right. and you go, oh no, they're di- they're <laughs> diverting from the story. Right. I no longer know what's going to happen. And they one-up it by dropping a flaming cross on the KKK bastard oh, instead perfect. of blinding the Cyclops. Because instead of, in the Odyssey, it's... The Cyclops has one eye. He is defined by his eye. Blind him, he becomes no longer what he is. Sure. But that's how everything in the Odyssey is, exactly. right? They're the one thing, and you get around the one but thing, and in, that's it. You know, Brother Art, though, he's not a Cyclops. He has one eye. That sucks for him. But what he is is he's a KKK bastard. Right, right. And the best way to one-up a KKK bastard, the best way to incapacitate it by his own means is to drop a flaming cross <laughs> on the yep. motherfucker so that he can burn like the bitch he is. Shortly after that, we move into the ending, and I think the ending in true form of the rest of the movie is such a perfect event. You have this mixture of the music, of, uh, I guess, a a kind of surreal, it seems supernatural, uh, event happening. The character arc works in the context of legend, and it even shows off the awesome color that I was talking about. It's everything that the movie is for me coming together at one point. And then, Would you say that it just all comes flooding in at once? Oh, God, I hate you. You even get a CG cow, which I know you're a huge fan of. Why they have to do the CG cow, man? What's so fucking hard about putting a cow on a roof? What is so hard about putting a fucking cow on a fucking roof? I think this gets back to that stupid animal rights thing we talked about earlier. Whatever. I would shoot that CG cow in a second. All right, never mind the CG cow. I was talking about Everett. Like a good son of a bitch, Everett, in his moment of desperation, oh, yeah, totally a god, help me out here. What am I doing? 
And I'm thinking, okay, well, that's kind of a bummer for I me. I believe Whatever. you pointed out this is what's called a character arc. Right, yeah, I, I see what they're doing there. But then, son of a bitch, right? I mean, yeah. that's the thing. As soon as, oh, Flood shows up, saves his ass. There's well, a perfectly scientific perfect, explanation right. for this. Right. And so, you know, one, there is a perfectly scientific explanation. Awesome. Thank you, Coen Brothers. Not necessary. Deliver it anyways. But two, he kind of gets what he wants in the end. Or so we're led to believe. Who knows how that sure. situation is going to go. Uh, but gets what he wants in the end. Perfect fucking con man story. It's just beautiful. Less beautiful is the Music Box Massacre 5 uh, lineup for next show. But we will talk all about that. I'm going to hand you this magical, revolutionary Music Box thing over here. All right, great. Um, so we have a website in the meantime. It's doublefeatureshow.com. We also have an email address I mentioned earlier, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. We have an iTunes that could really use some love if you want to uh, get on there and give send us, us a stars, little give review. Us some reviews. Yeah, and then also... Uh, we do donations. Nobody donated this week. So oh. if you could just go ahead and donate dot doublefeatureshow dot com, that would be fantastic. We would like that so very much. So we got a huge show coming up. Yeah. Uh, what's the lineup on this Music Box show? All right. So Music Box Massacre Five is going to consist of the original Hunchback of Notre Dame with right. I believe it's Lon Chaney Senior. It may be Junior, and I'm sure we talked about it when we recorded the fucking show last year. Uh, Isle of the Dead, Bucket of Blood, which is Roger Corman, the Black Cat. The Brood, Reanimator, From Beyond. You'll notice that's three Stuart Gordon oh, so boy. far. Pontypool, Dark Knight of the Scarecrow, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, which we kind of already covered. Yeah. And then Blood Feast, Maximum Overdrive, and Carry. So I'm going to tell you right now because I don't remember when I actually got to it in the show, but uh, you always bail before the last I movie. I always bail before the last movie. That's fine. I was tired and just having a cranky time, so I left, I think, two movies in. Came you home. left before the Stephen King ending, is what you yeah, left. right. And ended up watching the, the two movies uh, the next morning, which was a, a fantastic idea, as I believe I mentioned on the show. So uh, here's the big question that you know we arrived at last year, and now here one year later are arriving again. Are you going to be able to listen to our recording so that we can record nice little, hey, we're here this week, we showed up, uh, intro and outro for next week's show? Yeah, I'll do it. All right. We'll see if that's true when the show actually airs next week. Watch more fucking film. Bye.